Thank you. Uh, we're not going to say our, our spiel again, but uh, we are going to quickly reiterate the rules for the candidates. Um, candidates will begin with a two-minute opening statement. From then, you'll be given 90 seconds to respond to each question and a one-minute rebuttal time if necessary. At the end of the debate, each candidate will then have the opportunity to give a two-minute closing statement. We again ask that the candidates remain respectful to one another throughout the debate. Uh, we would like to thank our candidates for coming tonight, Green Party Colin Bennett, Democrat Norm Needleman, and Republican Art Linares. And we will now allow our candidates their two-minute opening statements, starting with Mr. Bennett. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursday night to be here. I'm gonna use this time during my opening statement to recognize some people in the audience and to make just one single point. First of all, please raise your hand if you've ever been a teacher. Thank you for your service. Please raise your hand if you've even worked at a summer camp with kids or teenagers. Thank you for your service. Anybody here started a community garden or even worked at a community garden? Cool. How about work for a nonprofit? Nice. Had a job directly helping people with special needs? Nice. Thank you. Here's one. How about, has anybody been arrested for a cause they believe in? Intentionally arrested for a cause that you believe in? Oh, that's too bad because you would have been in good company. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Brown, Jesus Christ. Anybody ever been a firefighter? Thank you. Has anybody ever been in the military? Thank you for your service. Obviously, these are just a few of the ways that we can serve our country and serve our communities. But I promise the point. Do you notice someone that raised their hand every time? I'm sorry, I actually forgot to raise my hand those first two times. Did you notice people who didn't raise their hand at all? That's experience. And I want to talk about experience tonight. Thank you, Colin. Uh, now, Mr. Needleman. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm Norm Needleman, and I'm running for the State Senate because I can deliver a new attitude, greater experience, and would be a better voice for our district in Hartford. My personal story is about succeeding in areas where our state is currently failing. I built a manufacturing business from the ground up. We have over 200 employees, most of them in Essex and Clinton, and provide fair wages and benefits, and the company is growing right here. As first selectman in Essex, I passed balanced budgets with bipartisan support every year. I am a Democrat, but I believe neither party has a monopoly on good ideas. I have encouraged differing perspectives to be brought to the table and built enduring relationships that focused on making our town better. We spend our time thinking about improving our town as opposed to coming up with ways to win the next election. Hartford needs to work for the people of our district again. That's going to take leadership. My candidacy is not about paving a political career path. It is about continuing the battle I fight every day to keep jobs in our community and to improve the quality of life in our district. We need to elect an individual who will give us a credible, compelling voice in Hartford. If you want someone who is ready to bring us 37 years of business experience, in 20 years of getting things done locally, then please vote for me. Thank you, Mr. Needleman, and now Mr. Linares. Good evening, everyone. I'm Art Linares, and it's been an honor to serve you as your state senator for the past four years. First, I want to thank uh, the Morgan Political Club for hosting us tonight. Wyatt, Daniel, thank you so much. And of course, Eric Bergman, uh, for your support. It's been great every year spending time talking with the students of Morgan. And how about this amazing Clinton School, this new Morgan School. I feel like we're in Carnegie Hall right now. This is pretty incredible. And I'm so happy that the students have a chance to enjoy and learn at a beautiful facility like this. I want to tell you quickly about myself. I 
own a small business called Green Skies uh, that I actually started out of the basement of my parents' home with one of my best friends who later became my brother-in-law and it is now a family business. Uh, together, we've built a company that, has, that now employs 76 people. Uh, we're building over 200 megawatts of clean, renewable power across 19 states and we're very happy to part be participating in an industry uh, that is creating the fastest growing jobs in America. And I like to take that experience of innovating and having new ideas and a vision uh, and, and building that vision to Hartford because I think we need it right now. I'm concerned about the direction that Governor Malloy is taking our state. And I believe that we can put Connecticut on a more prosperous path. I believe that we can have an economy that has a resurgence, a revival, that we can grow jobs and attract jobs to this state. And that if we control spending, we can reduce taxation and families can afford to live here and retire here. That is my vision for Connecticut, to make Connecticut the top of every list we want to be at the top of. I look forward to talking to you about that tonight. Thank you, Mr. Linares. And now we have our first question from Dan Radko. Balancing our state budget is one of the largest challenges you will face as a senator. How would you change the current approach to balancing the budget? What specific tax breaks, hikes, or incentives would you propose, and why would they be more effective than the current approach? And Mr. Needleman, this is yours. Sure, thank you. I have a lot of experience balancing budgets. I've been balancing them in my business for 37 years, and I balanced them in the town of Essex, um, in part when I was second selectman and then as a primary responsibility for the last five years. We balanced our budgets, we've generated surpluses, we've maintained our town services, rebuilt our infrastructure, and maintain a high quality of education. I think that there is there are flaws in the process in the way the state balances its budget or manages its budget. Um, they do start backwards, but I think that all, all states and municipalities will do that. They have to determine the needs and then they have to make the cuts that are going to be necessary to keep the state providing its essential services and at the same time um, with living within our means. It's not an easy task because there are unfunded liabilities that are sucking up a larger portion of our budget and we're gonna to need to find a way to manage that. That's gonna take bringing people back to the table, not mandating them back, and I think that I'm the kind of guy that's gonna be able to get up there and do that. Um, as far as tax credits, I think that we probably do need to eliminate any uh, income taxes on people who make under $100,000 a year and also um, eliminate some of the business filing fees and other things that make us less competitive. Thank you, Mr. Needleman. Mr. Linares, your response? Well, I find it interesting that Mr. Needleman supports those ideas because in the past two elections, he voted and donated to Governor Dan Malloy, who led our state on a much, much different path. Um, and in fact, Governor Malloy's message when he ran for office the first time and the second time were very similar to Mr. Needleman's. He said he was a municipal CEO. He said he knew how to collaborate, collaborate and he didn't quite answer the question when it came to taxes. And what we've gotten are over $4 billion of taxes in the past six years. And the reason why the budgets aren't balanced is because the one-party rule in Hartford, Governor Malloy and the democratically controlled legislature, has refused to have a bipartisan process in which Republicans can come to the table to advance their ideas. Here are some of the ideas that we want to advance, which we haven't been able to, but hopefully if we regain the Senate, we can do so. We want to consolidate some of our state agencies and our committees to make sure that we reform the process, that we budget our, we balance our budget based on revenues that come in, not on how much money we want to spend. We want to institute pension reform because the costs of funding pensions are starting to crowd out our ability to invest in education, to invest in infrastructure, to invest 
in everything that is our core basic service. Those are the things that we need to do and stop the wasteful spending, which does not seem to be able to happen under the current leadership in Hartford. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Mr. Bennett, your response? <coughs> Please, call me Colin. Um, believe it or not, I actually agree a lot more with Art on this than Norm. Um, Governor Malloy, Matthew Malloy, is driving our state into the ground. Connecticut is a great state. I love this place. We have so much wonderful things going on, but we also have so many liabilities, like Art said. This may sound reductive, but it really is that simple. I believe the best way to balance our budget and to bring in the revenue that we need to fund the programs that Connecticut needs to succeed is by taxing the wealthy. I think that that tax rate should be at least 10%. Right now I believe it's 6.7. I think it should be increased to 10%. Not overnight, but I think that it should happen over a course of no more than five years. Now, Art thinks that if we do that, the rich folks will leave. First of all, I say good riddance. If wealthy folks want to hold our state hostage by saying, hey, we don't like your taxes, we're going to leave, goodbye. You might have heard if you've been paying attention to this election on the presidential level, the term super predator. Super predator means the wealthy that are hijacking not only our state, but our country, because they're not paying our fair share. We need to tax those and make this a more equal playing field for everybody, especially low and middle income people that are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Needleman, rebuttal. I have to say nothing makes me happier than to hear that you agree with you. <laughs> um, and I agree that Dan Malloy has made a lot of very serious mistakes in how he's managed the state's budget. And I also agree that both parties in the legislature have made some serious mistakes. When the governor did submit a budget that was balanced, every legislator went running back to Capitol Hill because their constituents kept calling time after time after time and said, restore this, restore this, restore this. And one by one, every piece of funding got restored and both Democrats and Republicans did that and they did it simply because they wanted to get reelected. It was left to the Democrats in the legislature to go ahead and find a way to make things work, and there were small tax increases, and it's 6.99%, not 6.75. So with that, I would like to say there is hope, and I'm not Dan Malloy. I have a much better personality, to be quite honest with you. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Mr. Linares, your rebuttal. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I've gotten to know about Colin is that obviously we disagree on a lot of things, but the thing that I respect about him is that when he says something, he believes it, and he stands for it. Uh, what I've gotten from, uh, what I've learned about Norm is that he'll say something that is politically expedient for him and is running as a Republican, but you can say anything. It's about what you do. And for someone to support Governor Malloy, to support their own state representative who has voted for so many tax increases should give us all pause. It's about what you do. It's about your actions. And I have a record of standing up to this fiscal irresponsibility in Hartford. And the way that we can turn it around <coughs> is by making sure that we change the leadership. Currently, Senate, the Senate and the House and the governor's office is controlled by Democrats. And we have to advance our plan, the Republicans' plan, a confident future, which will help turn the economy around. It will help grow jobs because we're going to make Connecticut more business friendly. If you don't like what's happening in Hartford, change the leadership there. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Mr. Bennett, your rebuttal. This is fun, huh? <laughs> Again, thanks, Art. Um, I don't think that the three of us have very much in common, but one thing I think that we do have in common is the fact that I, quite literally, have been working to make the world a better place for my entire adult life. Art got involved in politics 
at a very young age, and while that's marginally making the world a better place, at least it's showing some initiative. This morning at a candidates forum, Norm said that at age 50, excuse me, 50 is when he decided to give back. Age 50, that's, wow, it's like, oh, finally you have the epiphany that maybe you should try to make the world a better place. I've been doing it for my entire adult life. Art's been doing it for most of his. That's a fundamental difference between us. So yeah, I'm glad that Art and I agree on a lot of different stuff. Again, I'm pushing for a fair share from the wealthy. That's as simple as that. We need to make people pay their fair share to help low and middle income people that are struggling on a day to day basis. Thank you, Colin. Now we're going to move on to our second question. American students nationwide are burdened with student loans and debt from pursuing higher education. The average college graduate in Connecticut has over $35,000 in student loans. What are your plans to make college more affordable and student loans more manageable for Connecticut students? And this question starts with uh, you, Colin. That's a big one, huh? So, making college more affordable is such an important thing. I think college should be free for public universities, for people who qualify and go to public universities. Paying for that is another thing. I was at the last candidates forum in Westbrook where somebody proposed an idea of a state salary cap of about, I think it was $68,000 for state employees. That's a pretty good idea, if you ask me. Why should state employees be making $100,000? Why should the coaches of the football teams at UConn making hundreds of thousands of dollars? Now I get it, the argument is they bring in money via their sports teams and yay, go UConn Huskies, and I'm specifically talking about the women's team, but in any case, yeah, um, in any case, again, when we have people being able to, corporations like GE paying essentially no taxes whatsoever, we're, this is, uh, the, we often, I often hear anyway, the system's broken. This is why corporations and wealthy folks like Donald Trump can get away with paying no taxes. The system's not broken. The system's working perfectly. The system was set up like this. We need to fundamentally change the system where people can't get away with skirting their responsibility to pay their taxes. And that's kind of a bigger picture answer to this, but I think it's fundamentally true. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Mr. Needleman, your response. The order is pretty standard. We alternate it, so it changes each time. So I actually believe that um, the first two years of college should probably be free. I believe the plan that Hillary Clinton has put forward and that Bernie Sanders put forward was actually a very good plan. Community colleges provide a gateway to a four-year degree and then to other degrees beyond that. And to keep that as inexpensive as possible and as affordable as possible, if not free for low-income people, I think is a great plan for our future. I think we should incorporate other trainings into that, like um, apprenticeships, which we've done through my company. Um, so I believe that we need to find a way private universities have become oppressively unaffordable. They build up huge endowments. They sit on their investments. They do research, which is important, but the cost to send people to a private university now is $65,000 a year, and it's ridiculous. We are pricing an entire generation out of education going forward, and I think that that's a shame. So we need to find a way, at least to our public universities, to be able to keep people going, and uh, middle-income families need to have tax breaks, whatever it's going to take to keep that, th that dream for the people who should be in college to get that at an affordable cost. I also believe that um, for people who can't afford it, or even people who could afford it, mandatory service of a year's worth of volunteer time would be a very good addition in our society. Thank you, Mr. Needleman. Uh, Mr. Lanaris, your response? Well, you know, there he goes again. Uh, wants to make college free for two years, but also wants to repeal the estate tax. Hillary Clinton supports a massive increase to the estate tax, 65% removing the step-up provision, including 20%, and then a 3.8%
Obamacare tax, Obamacare which you publicly supported as well. So you want free college, but you're not saying how you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna pay for it by tax increases, and we can't afford any more of that. I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to focus on driving down the cost of, edu of higher education by working with colleges. The amount of money that has gone to higher education across the country has gone up, and tuition has also gone up. That's not fair. We need to make sure that we drive the cost down. We also have to make sure that we educate our students, that they understand what kind of income they'll be having by taking on the different majors that will be available to them. A student that's majoring in finance should not take on the same size loan as a student that's majoring in social work. We have to find a way to educate these students to make sure that they're prepared for the future. Also, I think a great investment is an investment into our community colleges. We need to shift the amount of investment we're seeing from UConn more into our community colleges because students who go to community colleges stay here, work here, and we have to bridge the gap from technical schools into our businesses, and that's what we should be focusing on. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Uh, we're gonna offer the candidates a rebuttal, starting with Colin. So, one thing that I want to address is the fact that what a private university, even in Connecticut, whether it be Trinity or Connecticut College, <coughs> Yale, what they do and what they charge, I think the government has no business getting involved in that. If they want to charge, like Norm says, $65,000, and I think that's a bit. Really quickly, waste. We have to eliminate waste, and I wanted to share this with you. When I was a college first year student, and during my orientation, they welcomed us by a lobster dinner. Even when I was that young and somewhat naive, Thank you, Mr. Bennett. I was like, come on, lobster, give me a break. <laughs> you want me to rebuttal? I don't know which one is the conservative and which one is the socialist, because sometimes I hear conservative and sometimes I hear socialist. Art's desire to have the government intervene in charging one price for one major and charging another price for another major is ridiculous. Unfortunately, the state is facing a crisis budgetarily, as you know, and, um, and the cost of public education in one of the state universities is approaching $30,000 a year, if not a little bit more. <clears throat> and that's really a tragedy for our students that are going into college, that are in college now. Um, something has to give. Sitting down and talking to people is probably not gonna work. I think there are budgetary fixes and I think we have to decide as a society where we decide to put our resources. And, um, and education is a primary resource, both at the public school level and at the college level. Thank you, Norm. Mr. Linares, your rebuttal. I'll take this moment to also talk about uh, education at a local level. I, one of the concerns that I have is that our cities are, are struggling right now, specifically Hartford. Hartford must reorganize. Hartford must find a way to take control of their own destiny and start spending their, more, their money more wisely, working to privatize in their own city. And what we're seeing right now is a mayor that is pushing uh, to, reg to regionalize, pushing to use the property taxes from our small towns and a democratic majority that is supporting that. And that will take, that will rise property, raise property taxes in small towns like ours. I will push against that. I will encourage the cities to make sure that they learn fiscal responsibility so that our small towns have the ability to invest in our schools and our local education. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Our next question. As of 2016, Connecticut has had a poverty rate of 10.5% and an unemployment rate of 5.4%. What specifically would you do to eliminate poverty and create new job opportunities in the state? Why is this more effective than the plans of your opponents? Mr. Linares, we'll start with you. We need to focus on growing our, op our economy so that there are more opportunities uh, for folks that are looking for work and that are looking for good paying jobs. Now, how do we do that? The first thing we need to do is reduce regulations and find ways to make regulations more flexible so businesses can breathe, so they can grow. Did you know that over the past three years, the Department of Labor audited 95 
youth sports leagues. 95, and the reason why was because they were trying to classify subcontractors, referees, as employees. So a 15-year-old girl had to fill out a audit with the Department of Labor. These are the kinds of things that are far too intrusive, and anyone that runs a business understands that they're far too intrusive. These, our government agencies need to be looking for ways to attract companies here, to work with companies to help them grow, not stifle their growth. And when we do that, there'll be more opportunities for people to have jobs, <coughs> to raise them out of poverty. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Mr. Bennett? This is something that Art and I pretty much fundamentally disagree on. I love regulations. Yay, regulations. Regulations all damn day. Yes, there's onerous regulations. There are some bad regulations, but the vast majority of regulations are an awesome thing. I can get in my car and be reasonably assured that that car is going to be safe and get me home. I don't have to worry about it crashing because of bad manufacturing. It's because of regulations. I can walk into this building and be reasonably assured it's not gonna collapse on me because of regulations. I can eat food and be reasonably assured that that food's safe because the government is generally more or less protecting us. When we see things like car recalls and bad buildings and food, um, being contaminated. That's because businesses are trying to skirt and get around those regulations. I love regulations. I think we need more regulations. I think we should attract businesses, but I think we should attract businesses that serve their communities. That's the fundamental difference, I think, between all of us, or those two and me, is that businesses should serve their communities. I don't think that businesses should try just to suck and suck and suck like so many businesses do. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Needleman. Of course. As of 2016, Connecticut has a poverty, has a poverty, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Give me that one more time. <laughs> As of 2016, Connecticut has had a poverty rate of 10.5% and an unemployment rate of 5.4%. What specifically would you do to eliminate poverty and create new job opportunities in the state? Why is this more effective than the plans of your opponents? So that is a complicated question because what we have are fairly wealthy suburbs and um, fairly poor cities, and most of that poverty is in the cities. Although there are a reasonable number of people who don't live extraordinarily well outside of the cities, most of that poverty is there. As an employer, I can tell you we are now at the point of struggling to get qualified people to work for us because a lot of the people in the cities don't have adequate transportation. There's not a transportation infrastructure really to bring workers out to Essex and to Clinton here. So I think we need to spend a lot of time and energy focusing on helping the cities improve themselves. Art spoke about um, Hartford. They ha they are in a world of um, they're in a, they're in a mess. And uh, they do want to reach into the pockets of the surrounding towns. And as a first selectman, I've rallied the other first selectmen to stop that kind of thing from happening. We will not allow that. <clears throat> Essex sends about $24 million up to Hartford, and we get about seven or $800,000 back. So we feel that, that the cities need to spend their money wisely. The state needs to help them organize, and they need to organize themselves but the poverty is really centered there and that needs, that cannot continue long term. Thank you, Mr. Leon. Now, rebuttals. Mr. Linares, you may start. Another portion of, in, in, we have to grow jobs and that, I think speaking to regulations, Colin had mentioned that we, we need more regulations. I'm not suggesting that we get completely rid of re regulations in general. I'm saying we need to right-size them to make sure that we have enough that we can grow our economy and also keep our environment safe, but we have to have, make sure the regs are flexible. Uh, some of the ways we can do that are by streamlining licensing uh, for occupations so that folks that are in the city that are in, are in poverty can get a license and can go to work quickly. Reduce barriers to hiring 
Embrace uh, sh our sharing economy. Tesla wants to bring 250 jobs to Connecticut. I had to fight to bring Uber here so that they can start having ride sharing programs. And we had to work hard to bring Airbnb into Connecticut, but we did it. Reduce permits, uh, the, the wait time for permits is far too long. Encourage the private sector to invest in education so that we can have more students in their last few years of high school and college working and completing their diploma while working in our economy. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Harris. These are just a few things that we can do to grow jobs. And expanding the earned income tax credit instead of increasing minimum wage is the best way to raise, to lift people out of poverty and without reducing the amount of jobs in the state. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Mr. Bennett, your rebuttal. 30 seconds. I believe it's a minute. A minute. All right, first of all, did it occur to anybody besides me that, so Norm was just saying that there, his business in Essex is having trouble recruiting people because people from cities can't get to Tower Labs in Essex and Clinton. But he's the first select person of Essex and never mentioned the fact that there's so little affordable housing in Essex. That's either like absolute cognitive dissonance or just 100% hypocrisy. I'm just shaking my damn head. I mean, wow. Um, to get back to the original point though, again, raise taxes. We have to raise taxes on the wealthy and we 100%, I'll say this over and over again, raise the minimum wage, raise the minimum wage, raise the minimum wage. I detest the concept of a minimum wage. So I really would like to set a maximum wage, but in the interim, we're raising the minimum wage to a living wage, 100%. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Needleman, your rebuttal. Not that I want to spend a lot of time answering what Colin is saying, <clears throat> because I don't believe he's a serious candidate for this position. I will say that Essex has recently approved um, 26 units of new affordable housing and then another 65 units, a third of which are free market, uh, private development, um, affordable housing. We have been as aggressive as we can. Essex does not have a lot of land for affordable housing, but we have been working on trying to convince the Zoning Commission to allow accessory apartments. I still find it hard to believe that my Republican um, Friends here would argue against the minimum wage. The earned income tax credit is wonderful, but the issue about the minimum wage was litigated at the turn of the 20th century, and ARD represents a party that would take us back to the 20th century and the 19th century because that's the policies that they believe in. No minimum wage. They win that. I wonder if they're going to start litigating child labor laws next. Thank you, Mr. Hinnerman. We're going to move on to our fourth question. Both Connecticut Senators, Chris Murphy and Richard Blumenthal, have shown a fierce advocacy for, quote, common sense gun legislation, such as making it illegal for those on the FBI terror watch list to buy a gun. Do you agree with this or disagree? What is your position on gun control, and how will you enact policies to support your stance in the Senate? This question starts with Norm. Mr. Needleman. So I do support Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy and the entire Connecticut legislative delegation to Congress. I, I'm a gun owner, um, but I believe in common sense gun regulation. I just believe nobody should be able to get a gun without a background check. I believe that the gun show loophole should be closed. I believe that high caliber weapons, I mean high magazine quantity weapons should be banned outright because they serve no purpose other than to kill people. Um, so, uh, I, I believe in the Second Amendment, but I don't believe it's an unlimited right. Um, somebody arbitrarily decided that automatic weapons are illegal, but semi-automatic with 40, 40 shells in a magazine are fine. It's ridiculous and it's stupid that we haven't dealt with it at a national level. Thank you, Mr. There were two different bills in the U.S. Senate and the Congress to outlaw folks that were on the terrorist watch list, watch list from getting a gun. It was really unfortunate that they couldn't come together uh, to pass something. I think that ultimately they will. Um, I also think that at a, at a statewide level, most gun owners agree that 
there needs to be background checks, and that is something that gun owners support. The problem is the legislation that has been pushed by uh, Malloy and, and the Democratic majority is much is much uh, more intrusive than that. Uh, you cannot, you have to wait until you're 21 to get a gun license in Connecticut, but you can serve our country at 18. You have to be able to, you have to get a pistol permit to buy shotgun shells, which as a result actually drove the amount of pistols that were purchased, and pistols are the number one gun used for crime. Here's the point. What we need to do is come together and say, let's get the guns out of the hands of criminals and raise the sentences for people who are committing gun crime, not go after law-abiding citizens. I support having the right to own a gun if you're a law-abiding citizen, and I think we need to focus the conversation on crime and making sure that we put the criminals in a way so they don't they don't affect and violate laws in our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I truly believe this country is being torn apart. When we have a person as reprehensible as Donald Trump, as an actual national candidate, spewing heat at every single opportunity, I have such little confidence that we're going to make it. I like this because we can be kind of salty with each other without like getting into heat, but Norm actually had the audacity to say I'm not a serious candidate. I just kind of want to address that for a second. Here's a mailing that, I'm sorry, did I say R, I meant Norm. Norm sent out, his shirts are often wrinkled and we aren't sure he owns a suit. And I'm not a serious candidate. He never happier than when he's in more casual pants than these, or pajamas. Good for you, Norm. Go to bed. I mean, seriously. This is the best, and I'm not the serious candidate. Come on. As far as gun control, I don't have an answer for this. We have as many guns in this country almost as we have people. That's scary. I don't want to take away people's guns. I don't think anybody wants to take away people's guns. But we live in a country where people walk into school and murder little kids. That's not okay. We have to stop that. I don't know how, but we have to work together to stop that. Like, that's not okay. We can't live in a country where someone walks into a movie theater and shoots people, walks into a club and shoots 49 people. No, this has to stop. It's insane. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Now we'll be offering rebuttals, starting with Mr. Needleman. Thank you. I, um, I have to say that Art has uh, voted against both sensible gun control bills, one in the immediate aftermath of Newtown that may not have been a perfect bill, and, and the argument for people who want unlimited rights for guns and who are backed by the NRA is let's try to make the perfect be the enemy of the good. So he voted against the temporary restraining order for people who are accused of domestic violence and wouldn't allow guns to be taken out of people's houses for seven days until that temporary restraining order can become a permanent restraining order. That's a sin. That's actually a shame as far as I'm concerned. So in the post-Newtown, there was bipartisan support for um, gun control legislation. Art voted against it. Donald Trump is opposed to all gun control regulation. And I have to remind everybody that Art is an active supporter of Donald Trump. Thank you, they Mr. Agree on it. Thank you, Mr. Needleman. Mr. Linares, your rebuttal. The law that uh, Mr. Needleman was just explaining is, well, first of all, he didn't explain it correctly, and I'm not sure he even truly understands what it does. But what it does is essentially, if someone files a complaint against someone else, that person has to hand in their gun within 24 hours, otherwise they get a felony. Now, the reason why this is a problem is because in our country, you have the right to due process, to go to a judge and to for the judge to examine the situation. I think that in these cases, what we should have is a risk warning, where a judge can make the decision for people to go into a house and say, okay, we're going to make sure that we this person is dangerous, we're going to ask for the gun back. The problem is that 
you can disarm someone by simply filing, filing a complaint. That's not right. That's not America. We proposed a much better path. And so I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing is folks trying to use gun control uh, to divide us. We should be ganging up on the problem and finding ways to get guns out of the hands of criminals, invest in mental health. Thank you, Mr. Making, Harris. Making sure that we solve the root of the problem, not attacking law-abiding citizens. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Again, I don't have the answer. I generally agree with the idea that people on a terror watch list or a no-fly list shouldn't be able to buy guns. But I'm looking at the big picture here. Again, I don't want to take away people's guns. We have so many guns. It's lit that would literally be so improbable that borders on impossible. I mean, I'm going to go there. This country was founded on genocide. That's a fact. It was founded on genocide and then built on the backs of enslaved people. Our country was built on violence. That is the history of our country. I don't actually see a future. I do. I, I, I can see it. I'm not sure how to get there. I would love to see a world without guns. Again, I don't want to take people's guns away. This is a complicated issue that we're not going to solve right now, but I'm willing to have that conversation with anybody that has solutions for this because we have to eliminate this ridiculous violence we have in this country. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. I'd also like to remind the audience, please be respectful to the candidates. You may clap and your participation is allowed, but please be respectful. On to our next question. Connecticut is faced with many environmental issues, including an unhealthy and polluted Long Island Sound, issues with brownfields or contaminated sites, such as the Unilever factory here in Clinton, and independence on natural gas and petroleum. In your opinion, what is the number one environmental issue facing our state, and what will you do to mitigate it? Uh, Mr. Bennett, your response. So, not everything can be a priority. I have two priorities. One of them is to helping end the climate crisis. I think that is 100% the biggest environmental threat that faces our state. Not only in the environmental threat, it's a social justice threat. It's an education threat. It's a threat to our entire being, our entire existence, climate change. We need to make an immediate transition to preferred sources of energy, clean sources of energy, renewable source of energy. Hopefully Art can agree with this with a solar panel company, but this needs to happen today. Not one more mountain needs to be blown up for coal. Not one more oil rig, offshore or not. Not one more fracking well, not one more pipeline. We need climate justice and we bring that, we work toward that in Connecticut by making an immediate transition to solar and to wind as primary sources of renewable energy. And we can do that by incentivizing both those preferred sources of energy and then de-incentivizing dirty, dirty fossil fuels. We need to make climate a priority, absolutely. In addition to this, we need to designate national parks in Connecticut. Connecticut has one national park. That's pathetic. Connecticut is a beautiful, awesome state. We need to designate national parks to permanently protect the lower Connecticut River Valley, which Norm claims to love. We need to protect Long Island Sound. And the best way to do that is permanent protections for national parks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benham. Mr. Edelman. So I would have to agree that climate change is probably the most significant environmental issue facing us, but Connecticut has actually done a pretty good job in protecting the environment. Local land trusts have bought up large tracts of land. They do it with public-private partnerships, and I support that, and the town of Essex has supported that. <clears throat> I don't believe that we can make an abrupt transition away from fossil fuel, but I believe that coal is a thing of the past, and clean coal is an oxymoron. So I think that the move towards natural gas as a bridge fuel makes sense. I applaud um, Art's uh, business and his family's business at Green Skies. I, I kind of wish that they bought their solar panels domestically, but, uh, but that's a business choice that they've made. And, uh, and I, I think that Connecticut has a very good environmental record. The Long Island Sound, the Connecticut River is one of the most pristine rivers in the world and it's gonna to continue to be that way because it's very well protected and very well preserved. Thank you, Mr. Needleman. Mr. Linares? Well, first I wanna to respond to what Mr. Needleman said about my business. We 
due by uh, some panels from Canada, from Germany, from all over the world. Uh, and we made a very, very strong effort to purchase American-made panels. The problem is they don't exist. And that's because the cost of manufacturing in this state and the, the just the, the trade deals that we've seen have pushed American manufacturing out. We need to reform that so we can make solar panels in America. I would be the first one to advocate for purchasing them, and I will do that. Uh, I'm very proud of what Green Skies has done in Connecticut. We've built uh, countless megawatts of solar energy in this state. We've created jobs for electricians, for technicians, for folks that are dedicated to, to uh, a clean energy future. Uh, I've also worked on a bipartisan effort uh, to get a clean water pipeline built from Chester to Haddam. There was arsenic found in the water that uh, at levels that were concerning, we were able to acquire the funding to complete that pipeline so that folks will have clean water. I also think that natural gas is a, is a serious concern. We should be a serious concern. Natural, natural gas pipelines leak, and we have to be concerned about building more natural gas in this state Governor Cuomo put a moratorium on natural gas coming through New York, so we can't build pipelines anymore of natural gas. We should be focusing on a comprehensive energy plan with solar, with wind, with nuclear energy, so that folks in Millstone will stay here. That's something that I'll focus on, and of course, fighting for open business space is always something that I've done. We were preserved to preserve when I was in the state senate. Thank you, Mr. Stop the Adam land swap, and I'll continue fighting for open space. Now it's time for rebuttals. Mr. Bennett. So just to be clear, natural gas is a euphemism. It's methane, it's dirty, it's destructive, it's dangerous. We shouldn't use that term, natural gas. There's not really anything natural about it, especially when it comes from fracking. It's one of the worst things happening on the planet, that mountain top removal and other fossil fuel extraction. So let's stop saying natural gas. Let's call it what it is, methane, and it's dirty, destructive, and dangerous. Um, Norm is right, you know, we, the Connecticut River Valley has been protected, but it needs permanent protection. Like I said, a national park would bring in jobs. It would bring in people from all over the world. People already come from all over the country, and people do come from all over the world. But having that designation of a national park would be awesome for the environment, but it would also be awesome for our economy. And then I think in the question you mentioned brownfields. Brownfields came up at our candidate um, forum this morning. Brownfields are a result of companies skirting those regulations and getting away with it, including GE that everybody's like, oh, look at poor Connecticut because GE left. Good riddance to stupid GE. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Mr. Edelman. So actually, most of the brownfields in Connecticut are a result of companies that are no longer in business and that have abandoned those properties. Um, and the Connecticut River is a, uh, there's a, a, an organization called the Connecticut Gateway Commission, which is, well, the, the Connecticut River Gateway Commission, which does protect the river. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say that, uh, that you're gonna have to find a way to uh, buy domestic solar panels if Donald Trump gets elected, because Donald Trump is gonna renegotiate every trade deal, and there are gonna be no imported products coming in here. He's gonna impose 30 and 40% tariffs on things from China, from Canada, from Mexico because NAFTA stinks, because China's unfair. That's the candidate that you support. I don't know how you're gonna do business without them um, supplying you with your product. So, look, I'm, I'm, I'm for finding a moderate path to the future. I really do believe climate change is gonna really significantly destroy the planet, and we need to find the fastest path possible out of using fossil fuels. I have no disagreement with any of that. Thank you, Mr. Neal. All right, we're going to now offer the candidates their two-minute closing statements, uh, starting with Mr. Bennett. That went by quickly, huh? Well, kind of. Parts of it were excruciating. Um, so what I'm bringing here is bigger than just election. You might have heard me this say this before. I'm on a mission to save the world. I'm quite literal about that. You don't have to agree with me on much, but I want you to know that 
no matter what, I am fighting the good fight. I'm fighting to make this world a better place. Serving as a state senator would help. It would help a lot. But come November 9th, regardless if I win this election, I'm going to continue that fight. I'm asking you to vote for me again to help. But there's one thing I want to do, because it might be a little bit or unorthodox, I'll say, but I want to close with a quote, because I think it's needed in these times. And this quote was written by a woman that I don't know, but it was happened the day after the massacre in Orlando, when somebody walked in and killed 49 people. This is the quote. I think it's relevant today. Yesterday, and continuing into today, admits the pain and rage. I've seen so many posts calling us to love each other more, harder, deeper. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Don't just post about it. Call a friend you haven't seen in a while. Forgive a friend for that petty drama that happened 20 years ago. Be accountable to that friend that you've wronged. Hold space for that friend who is in pain, even though their pain makes you uncomfortable. Smile at a stranger the next time you're at a queer event. Make your love actionable. I might be the Green Party candidate and you can despair to me all as you want, not serious, I can be the hippie, I can be whatever you want, but this is the message. We need to move forward together. We need to stop the hate, we need to stop the violence. And we really start that first step is by loving each other, reaching out and doing our best to find common ground. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dinovin, your closing statement. Thank you. I've been lucky enough to learn as I've gone through life. The lessons that I've learned taught me to grasp the complexity of difficult problems. This is especially true in public service. It's not a sporting event. This is a democracy. There is no such thing as winner take all. If your only goal is for your party to dominate and you adopt all of their talking points as gospel, you may advance your career and become a successful politician, but you'll be a terrible public servant. The best public servants listen more than they talk, and they work with all the people who want to work with them, regardless of political affiliation. After four years, my opponent has chosen over and over again to support and vote for the policies of the extreme right. His choices as your state senator have earned him the endorsements of the organizations from the Trump fringe of the Republican Party. Art opposes a woman's right to choose. He opposes sensible gun control. He supports right-to-work policies that would harm working families, and he supports the candidate for president who constantly demeans women, demeans minorities, and is xenophobic. When people ask, when people speak to Art, he tries to sound moderate. He avoids telling people what, they, what he really believes. He dances around questions like a professional politician. I will always tell you where I stand on an issue. It may not be a simple answer, because I believe there are a few simple answers to complex problems. Public policy cannot be summed up in one line or one talking point. Resolving the issues that face our state will take someone with maturity, judgment, problem-solving skills, and a deep understanding of the issues that affect our citizens, businesses, and towns. I am that person. Please vote for me on November 8th. There were many accusations that I don't work in a bipartisan way. Well, the first day after I was elected, I was called into an office with a town leader and a superintendent that <coughs> actually stood up against me when I ran, but I met with them anyway. And they talked about how they had made a mistake in filing for a reimbursement for school funding. And I told them that I would work together with them. And without touting uh, getting the job done, I decided I wanted to get it done in a bipartisan way in the legislature without political fanfare. We got it through the Senate uh, in a majority, a full school reimbursement. And when it wasn't complete, when there wasn't enough money for the school reimbursement, I got it done again in 2015 to complete it. And I got it done in a bipartisan way. And that school is the school that you're sitting in today. We were able to pass that bill unanimously through the Senate. I can get it done, I can build a better Connecticut for everyone. And you know, my opponent, because he's bankrupt of ideas, he decided to make who I'm voting for president his entire campaign. Not the policies of his friend Governor Malloy, who he proudly donated to in every election. Not the cuts the Democrats made 
to our small towns so that they can continue to throw money at the cities. Not the tax increases, which my opponents supported. Not the mileage tax, which I oppose. Not Malloy's unfunded mandates that are crushing our towns and school budgets. Not that I co-sponsored funding for universities to provide trained examiners for sexually assaulted victims. Not that I co-sponsored improving programs to prevent sexual assault. But instead, something that has nothing to do with our small towns. I'm voting for the best economic plan that will help Connecticut, and that's the Republican ticket. And shame on Dan Malloy's machine for sending that mailer out about Dr. Pettit. That is embarrassing. I will not make this campaign, I will not make this campaign about emails, abused interns, ambassadors and military personnel murdered in Benghazi, a wife covering up for her husband's disrespect for women, millions of dollars being funneled in to a organization that is supposed to be nonprofit. I won't do it because that has nothing to do with being a state senator. And anyone who wants to decide on that does not deserve to represent our state and is bankrupt of ideas. I will stand for a vision to build a better Connecticut, a prosperous economy, a magnet, a state that is a magnet for families to retire here, to raise their families here, to educate their children. Thank you, Mr. Lance. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Morgan Political Club, I would like to offer our sincerest thanks to the candidates for volunteering their time to come before us and exchange their ideas and opinions, as well as treating the debates with professionalism and respect. Special thanks to Liam, Sarah, James, and as well as Mr. Bergman, our advisor, for working to make this happen. Thank you to the audience as well for coming to listen to opposing perspectives and ideas. I urge you to make sure you and your family, friends, and colleagues get out and vote come November. Quick reminder, the candidates will be available in the lobby for questions, as will myself and other members of the political club. We are currently soliciting donations for a trip to Washington, D.C., and all contributions are greatly appreciated. Art took up a lot of extra time, so I'm going to say one more statement because we did come up in this debate. It is oh, we're not doing it. We need to hear over and over again, Black Lives Matter. Again, Black Lives Matter. This is Dan Radka, and I'm Wyatt Rue, and it has been a pleasure hosting and moderating the Connecticut State Senate and General Assembly debates tonight. We hope you have become more informed on the candidates and their positions, and we continue to encourage everyone to participate in our democracy. Thank you, and good night.